Hello everyone. I want to talk to you today about the Age of Enlightenment. The Age of Enlightenment is one movement among several that marks the transition from the Reformation era to the modern era. Other movements during this period of time include Pietism, beginning in Germany but impacting England and especially America, and Revivalism, which begins with John Wesley in England but bears its greatest fruit during the Awakenings in America. And American Christianity itself has a major impact, not only in the New World but globally as well. These are the broad topics of Unit 4, but let's back up and review the Age of Enlightenment. The Age of Enlightenment takes place during the 17th and 18th centuries among a series of philosophers who changed the worldview of Western culture. Their themes include knowledge, reason, freedom, and liberty. These philosophers often worked off of each other. In the background to the Age of Enlightenment is the Thirty Years' War, which was the culmination of a series of religious wars between Catholics and Protestants. This particular war uh, ended with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, and in a very broad way this date marks the end of the Reformation era. Now, this religious war was particularly violent and destructive. It marked a great deal of loss of life and loss of property. The atrocities of this religious war led to an indifference toward religion and a rise of the modern secular state. As Justo Gonzalez asks the question, was there not a more tolerant more profound and even more Christian way to serve God than simply following the dictates of orthodoxy, be it Catholic or Protestant? An important question to ask in an age when religious violence had uh, caused so much destruction. Of course, we need to remind ourselves that all wars are based on a desire for property, wealth, and power, but often these wars are covered with a veneer of religion because if the state can couch these wars in terms of holy wars, then they become more personal for those who are uh, doing the actual fighting. But nonetheless, uh, certainly, uh, the Thirty Years' War uh, was in, in many ways a religious war, and it led people to question the wisdom of following specific, special revelation as the Catholics and Protestants did with their doctrines. So the characteristics of the Age of Enlightenment include a union of science and reason that emphasized humanity's goodness uh, and the humanity's progress, the innate rights and freedom of humanity. According to the philosophers of the Enlightenment, reason is the only path to truth. Uh, the only source of knowledge. Supernatural revelation is rejected because again doctrinal religions had led to war. A religion based on reason is more reasonable because everyone had access uh, to reason. So all enlightened individuals will arrive at the truth uh, following natural laws that govern the world and humanity. 
and these laws could be discovered by reason apart from God and supernatural revelation. The thinkers of the Enlightenment desired this universal natural religion, not based upon revelation, but upon reason. They had a belief in uh, inevitable progress of humanity. So, of course, this was a very optimistic view, but actually a very naive optimism that does not consider or understand the doctrine of sin. In fact, the doctrine of sin uh, is a common opponent against which all the different trends of the philosophy of enlightenment join forces. So humanity, uh, according to these philosophers of religion, uh, could be freed from the chains of authority and the tradition of government and church. Uh, they taught that government's power should be reduced. Uh, they taught that the government exists to protect the rights of the people. This we will see from John Locke and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, they felt that state churches were intolerant and should not be dogmatic about doctrine. There are five developments, or think of these as different philosophies or worldviews uh, that developed during the Age of Enlightenment. And each of these uh, philosophies is accompanied by a key word that perhaps will help you uh, remember each one and identify them and keep them uh, separate. The first is rationalism, which emphasizes reason, and then empiricism, and the key word there is experience. Deism is more of a religion that uh, focuses on an impersonal God. Romanticism, uh, the key word there is a return to nature or to natural revelation. And then finally there's rational idealism, uh, key word there is subjectivity. Okay, now let's unpack these different uh, philosophical worldviews, beginning with rationalism, okay, founded by Rene Descartes. You see uh, his life dates there functioning mostly in the 17th century. Now, he was a Catholic uh, born in France uh, who then moved to Holland and uh, finally uh, lived out the last years of his life in Sweden. We consider him the father of modern philosophy. Uh, and uh, his uh, philosophical uh, insight uh, occurred in the winter of 1619 to 20 when he entered into a stove. Now that sounds very unusual to us, uh, but think of it as a heated room. When you saw the uh, a movie about Luther, you may recall a scene where Frederick the Wise was sitting in a very large fireplace uh, and he went inside to warm up. Okay, so this is the picture of a stove where uh, Descartes uh, entered to, uh, to, uh, to gain this philosophical insight. Okay, so we call his, uh, his philosophy Cartesianism or rationalism, and it says that reason, not sensory data, is the source of knowledge. So his basic principle is never to accept anything as true if I did not have evident knowledge of its truth, that I had no occasion to doubt it. Well, as he began to reject uh, this idea and this idea, uh, he came to the first undeniable truth, his own existence. Since he could not doubt that he was doubting, he could be certain that he existed. 
And so uh, this is the basis of his very famous uh, uh, quotation, I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. Now, John Locke, uh, whom we will study in a bit, uh, was a critic of Descartes and his rationalism, and he said that anyone skeptical enough to doubt his own existence should enjoy the experiment until hunger sets in and brings him back to reality. Okay, so uh, Descartes' idea did have uh, its detractors. His second undeniable truth was the existence of God. He found in his mind the idea of a more perfect being. And since his finite mind could not produce the idea of an infinite God, he concluded that God exists. For those of you who remember Anselm of Canterbury from our study of scholasticism during their, the medieval history, uh, you may recall Anselm and his ontological argument uh, that sounds very much like Descartes' argument. Uh, Anselm said, God is that than which nothing greater uh, can be conceived. And if I conceive of absolute being, he must exist. We'll talk more about Anselm in just a moment. All right, uh, next, Descartes affirmed the existence of his own body and the world. Very interesting. I myself have never uh, spent any time doubting the existence of my body. I simply look down and I see it sticking out in front of me. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Descartes, uh, as he is seeking the very uh, basis of knowledge, is affirming uh, his own existence, the existence of God, and next, the existence of his own body and the world. He affirmed that humans consist of two parts, one that thinks, and one that occupies space, in other words, soul and body. And then further theological and philosophical questions were asked about the communication between the soul and body and the relationship between spirit and matter. But for us, uh, let's move on to a study of empiricism and its leading advocate was John Locke, who was a professor at Oxford who wrote an essay of human understanding in 1690, uh, thereby uh, introducing the idea of empiricism. His uh, idea is that all knowledge is derived from sensory experience. Okay, so unlike Descartes, who looks within, uh, John Locke is uh, uh, beginning from outside uh, one's body, outside one's mind, uh, to experience and to learn. Uh, he considered uh, a human being uh, tabula rasa, that is uh, an, uh, an, an empty tablet, and he begins to uh, experience and to learn. So he is uh, more of a materialist than a rationalist. There are three levels of experience that provide certain knowledge. One is our own selves. Second, our experience of environment. And third is God, whose existence is proven by the existence of self and its experiences. John Locke uh, taught that uh, judgment or knowledge is based upon probability because one cannot continually observe and experience all things at all times. Uh, faith is based upon probability, not on certain knowledge because it is derived from revelation rather than uh, reason. 
the application of uh, Locke's empiricism to religion is that knowledge of God is certain. One knows intuitively that he or she exists, and since everyone had a beginning, someone must have caused it. Nothing cannot provide a beginning, therefore something that is God must be eternal to create the world. In 1695, he wrote The Reasonableness of Christianity. He said, The core of Christianity is the existence of God and faith in Christ as Messiah. Okay, so notice God and Christ uh, at the core of Christianity. But Locke did not believe that Christianity added anything important that could not have been known by use of reason and judgment. Christianity simply was a clear expression of truths and laws that could have been known through a person's natural faculties. And so he sets aside uh, Christianity uh, and emphasize in, emphasizes instead uh, empiricism. Now at this point, I would like to bring uh, at least these two uh, enlightenment philosophers into a uh, focus of the of a philosophical family tree that stretches all the way back to Plato, the Greek philosopher uh, of uh, 428 to 348 BC. Okay, and Plato was a very influential philosopher, uh, idealistic. Uh, postulating reality from general to specific. Uh, Plato is the one who uh, taught that uh, above and beyond our present reality uh, is a universe of ideals. Okay, And uh, this was a, a very uh, pervasive philosophy uh, in ancient classical uh, Greek times, but also was very influential upon the church because it was mediated by Augustine of Hippo. Augustine having uh, been through a time where he was influenced uh, greatly by Neoplatonism. And so Augustine infused the medieval church with this Platonic idea of idealism and an emphasis on the general. It is for this reason that uh, society in the uh, early and medieval era of the church emphasized the church and the state, the greater good uh, than uh, above the individual. Now, Aristotle, who was Plato's student, uh, was a more materialistic philosopher, and he uh, began with the specific to the general, and so he focused on uh, empirical evidence that he could see and he studied that and then generalized to a broader philosophy. Aristotle's philosophy however was lost to the West until after the Crusades and so Aristotle had little in, uh, influence on the early and medieval eras of the church uh, but during the uh, high Middle Ages that would change. In the uh, early Middle Ages, during the, uh, the earlier uh, uh, period of scholasticism, Anselm of Canterbury, whom we just mentioned, uh, was an important uh, philosopher who applied reason uh, to faith, but beginning with faith. He said, I believe to understand. And he's uh, well known for his ontological proofs for the existence of God. Uh, as I just suggested, he taught God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. If I conceive of absolute being, he must exist. Okay, so uh, he looked within to determine uh, proofs for the existence of God. Now, after Anselm, uh, came Thomas Aquinas, who was the great philosophical theologian of the later scholastic period. 
and he taught the cosmological proofs for the existence of God, uh, teaching that uh, in the realm of experience, everything that we know is caused by something else. Therefore, there must be an uncaused cause, an unmoved mover, a necessary being, and this all people call God. All right, and so uh, you can see how uh, Anselm connects to Descartes. Although Descartes emphasized reason above faith, nonetheless, he said, I understand in order to believe. Uh, and he looked within his mind for uh, proof of his own existence, but also for the existence of God, uh, as we just uh, determined. And so we just looked at John Locke, who, who taught that knowledge is derived from sensory experience. And like Aquinas, uh, he sees proofs for the existence of God from the evidence of his eyes and uh, uh, touch and his experiences. Okay, so I just added this philosophical family tree so you could see the connections throughout history between different branches of philosophy. Plato, uh, Augustine, Anselm, Descartes, Aristotle, Aquinas, and Locke. Okay, well, let's move on and look at uh, David Hume, an 18th century Scottish philosopher and historian who used reason to show the limits of reason. He taught that all one knows is what one perceives. Absolute knowledge is not possible. Okay, so he is uh, known as a skeptic. Uh, one does not know anything that one cannot perceive. One therefore cannot know God or miracles or the future. One cannot perceive them. Uh, knowledge is almost always opinion. And therefore, Hume's skepticism revealed the inadequacies of empiricism. When you apply Hume's skepticism to religion, well, he says that one cannot prove God. Miracles, the resurrection, these must be accepted by faith. Religion is personal and private, so one cannot state with certainty that one religion is better than another. So there is a gap for Hume between knowledge and faith and between what is and what ought to be. Uh, empirical evidence describes what is but cannot prescribe what ought to be so he sees a disconnect between science and ethics. David Hume uh, as you can well understand is considered the patron saint of agnostics. Now I'm going to switch uh, um, trains of thought here and talk about deism uh, which is uh, more of a religion rather than a philosophy and it was a desire among some who sought to overcome divisions within Christianity by affirming a small core of commonly held Christian beliefs. Okay, What is the common denominator among different uh, religions. Well, on one side, they oppose this narrow dogmatism of Christianity, but on the other side, they oppose the easy skepticism of those who abandoned all religion. Samuel Johnson defined deism as the opinion of those that only acknowledge one God without the reception of any revealed religion and who reject Christ. Okay, So deism is a belief in God, but a rejection of supernatural revelation and a rejection of Christ as uh, a divine being. Christ was a moral teacher, but he was not divine and not a worker of miracles. Now, one of the uh, leading advocates for deism was Lord 
Herbert of Sherbury, uh, considered the father of English deism. Uh, Sherbury was unsure whether to publish his treatise on truth. Uh, his treatise exalted rationalism, but then he decided that he would uh, publish it because he received a positive sign. That is, he heard a loud noise in a cloudless sky, and that persuaded him to publish his treatise. Now that's rational, isn't it? Oh, I heard a loud noise in a cloudless sky, therefore that convinces me to publish my treatise on uh, rationalism. Well, uh, be that as it may, let's, uh, let's consider what came out of this idea of deism. Where Christianity agrees with natural religion, it is true and reasonable. But wherever Christianity adds special revelation, it lapses into superstition. Therefore, they reject uh, the miracles, they reject uh, Christ's divinity, they reject his resurrection, all because uh, this does not agree with natural revelation revelation, natural religion. Uh, instead, it depends upon special revelation, which they equate with superstition. They see God as a divine watchmaker. That is to say that God uh, created the earth and set it into motion, but then set it aside so that it functions uh, naturally on its own without uh, divine intervention just as a, uh, as, a, as a man can create a watch and uh, get it to running and set it aside in the same way God created earth and set it aside. For that reason, uh, God certainly would not send his own son uh, into the world to save the world uh, because God does not intervene in uh, uh, the natural uh, workings of his creation. Deism has five doctrines. One, God exists. Two, God is to be worshipped. Three, the practice of virtue is the true worship of God. Fourth, people must repent. Okay, so uh, there is a, a virtue and there is a practice that is against virtue. Therefore, people must repent of uh, any rejection of virtue. And the fifth doctrine is there are future rewards and punishments, which seems to be a uh, contradiction to this idea uh, that God does not intervene. Okay, But among the five doctrines of deism, there's no place for Jesus Christ, uh, the Trinity, or the Bible. Now, uh, there is a sixth doctrine, and that is the belief in God as a governing and overruling providence who guides and determines the destinies of nations. And so uh, there is a sense in which deism had a, a powerful influence on uh, um, the founding of America. Noted American deists include uh, possibly George Washington. Now, there is debate among scholars uh, over Washington's adherence to deism. Uh, in fact, there is a legend that he was baptized by a Baptist preacher in New York uh, named John Gano. But we do know that George Washington uh, was a, an, an active uh, practicing member of uh, the Anglican Church. Nonetheless, he often is included among the American deists, which also include uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, no doubt of his deism. Uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, often people talk about the Thomas Jefferson Bible, and by the way, I have a copy of that in my library. But uh, he uh, edited the New Testament and took out all of the miracles uh, because he denied them. Uh, and then Thomas Paine said, I believe in one God and no more. Okay, now we need to recognize that, uh, that deists 
felt very positively toward Christianity, even though they denied the divinity of Jesus Christ, nonetheless, they exalted his teachings uh, because they would um, uh, influence the morality of those who followed Christ's teachings. And therefore, they were very positive about Christianity. Uh, they simply did not believe in uh, all the tenets of Christianity themselves. As Thomas Paine said, I believe in one God, but I don't believe in uh, the divinity of Jesus Christ, certainly not the Holy Spirit, uh, just one God, uh, a classic deistic statement. Okay, well, the fourth uh, philosophical worldview we look at is uh, Romanticism, uh, an example being Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, of the 18th century. He was a Frenchman, he's reacting against Calvinism, uh, was reacting against his teachings on human depravity and original sin. Remember that uh, these Enlightenment philosophers are very uh, naive about sin, very optimistic about the human nature. Uh, he wrote the Social Contract, which paved the way for the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Rousseau was opposed to the divine right of kings. Uh, teaching that neither the, lo the law nor the government are appointed by God. They are based on the general will of the governed. Society is based on a social contract designed to combine individual freedom with just government. And so he was the leader of romantic philosophy. Romanticism uh, teaches that humanity has deviated from its natural pristine state. Uh, natural religion has been corrupted by modern doctrines, therefore these doctrines must be stripped away. People are noble and good. Okay, uh, It's the institutions and society that are problems. They set up rules which we cannot meet, uh, therefore we feel sinful. Instead, it does not matter what one believes or does, as long as one is generous and has a warm heart, okay? And so we hear these kinds of arguments today. Uh, it does not matter what one believes as long as one is sincere, okay? Or in this case, generous and warm-hearted. All right, finally, we come to rational idealism represented by uh, Immanuel Kant. Uh, he represents the climax of 18th century rationalism and empiricism. Uh, he was initially influenced by Descartes, but it says he was awakened from his dogmatic slumber by Hume and his skepticism. Uh, here is a, uh, uh, an, an illustration that was uh, drawn for me by uh, my good friend and student, Christopher Johnson. Christopher is a fan of uh, of, of church history and theology, uh, but also he is an artist and like me, he loves comic books. And so he designed this, uh, this comic uh, with a new character, Sherlock Hume. And uh, you can see uh, Hume uh, in the front uh, with this uh, magnifying glass examining a, uh, a murder but uh, behind him is Kant saying, Hume, your scream awoke me from my dogmatic slumber. Is it a murder? No, Kant, there is no causal relationship between these stab wounds and the man over there holding a bloody knife. Another case solved. Well, obviously the case is not solved, but uh, this is simply uh, Christopher's way of poking fun at Hume and his skepticism. All right, moving on from uh, art uh, to uh, uh, the PowerPoint, uh, rational idealism uh, and Kant. Uh, Kant wrote the critique of pure reason, which expressed his view of knowledge. Uh, purely objective knowledge does not exist since all input is mediated by one's senses. 
it is not possible for one to get outside of oneself to verify the objective nature of one's experiences. All that remains is perceptions and opinions, and uh, everything beyond one's subjective understanding is based on faith. You will recall that the key word for rational idealism is subjectivity. And certainly this is what Kant is expressing here. He says there's no such thing as knowledge. All we can know is the thing as our mind grasps it, but not what the thing really is. And this is illustrated by an old fable of six blind men and an elephant. Now this does not originate with uh, uh, Kant, but nonetheless this uh, I think illustrates well what he is saying. You may remember the story of six blind men that encounter an elephant and each man touches uh, a different part of the elephant and therefore comes to a different conclusion about uh, the, the, uh, the object before him. One uh, grasps the, uh, the elephant's tusk and says this is a spear. Another one grasps the, uh, the trunk and says this is a snake. Another man uh, finds uh, the ear and says this is a fan. Uh, another man is, uh, is uh, touching the side, the immense side of the elephant and says this is a wall. Another one uh, puts his arms around a leg and says, no, this is a tree. Finally, the, uh, the, the blind man in behind the elephant grabs the tail and says, no, it's a rope. All right, so uh, I hope you can see how uh, this illustrates Kant's idea that, that we cannot know uh, anything. Uh, all we can know is what our mind grasps. So again, rational idealism uh, is subjective and individual. All right, so applying rational idealism to religion, uh, we conclude that it is impossible to prove God's existence. Theology then is based on sub a subjective moral basis. Uh, Jesus then is the personified idea of the good principle. Uh, God is the highest good. All right, belief in God is the highest good leads to obedience, which then leads to rewards in the afterlife. Uh, finally, as long as you are sincere, it does not matter what you believe. And so this becomes the basis of Unitarianism. Okay, the idea that uh, there is only one God uh, and uh, whatever you believe about that God as long as you are sincere, you will be saved. Okay, so Unitarian Universalism comes out of this idea of rational idealism. So, we can see a progression of skepticism. The beginning point uh, at the Reformation is the idea of sola scriptura. The Bible uh, reveals truth. Uh, Descartes, Cartesian doubt, says we cannot trust the Bible. Reason reveals truth. Hume's skepticism says we cannot trust reason. Everything that cannot be touched is not real. Kant's rational idealism says we cannot trust knowledge. And Kant is the culmination of 18th century rationalism, leaving uh, the 19th century liberal theologians to sort out uh, the relationship of faith and reason. And so we will encounter uh, the 19th century liberal theologians when we um, uh, reach Unit 6. So, uh, here I am again. All right, let, let me ask, what are some positives that come out of the Age of Enlightenment. Well, obviously, the advance of science, 
uh, because of the emphasis on empiricism and experience uh, and uh, this, this emphasis on the material has led to many advances in science and medicine uh, through uh, experimentation. Another positive that came out of uh, the Age of Enlightenment is democracy, obviously influenced by Rousseau and his social contract, as I said. Uh, that aspect of uh, Enlightenment philosophy had tremendous impact on the American Revolution. But there are negatives also uh, that come out of the Age of Enlightenment, certainly uh, uh, this, uh, the atheism, uh, denial of God, and skepticism, a denial of, of supernatural revelation, the divinity of Christ, uh, doctrines of the Trinity, uh, all had a very negative impact on the relationship of religion to the world. Uh, so why do we study the Age of Enlightenment? Well, because it had a tremendous impact on the world view of today, and therefore we need to be aware of uh, the, uh, the importance of these philosophers as they move the world from uh, the era of, of the Reformation into the modern era and uh, what they taught and the worldviews that they introduced have a tremendous impact on us even today. Well, thank you for your attention.